Hi, this is Scott Fresner, developer of TCEPs and Fast Films. I'd like to talk to you about the basics of using Adobe Photoshop. This is Photoshop CS3, which is known as version 10. And what I'm going to show you right now would actually work on anything higher than version 5.0. Now, for many of you, Photoshop is a mystery. You open it up, you look at it, your eyes glaze over, and you go back to Corel Draw or Illustrator. Photoshop seems like kind of the magic program that people are afraid to just jump into. And really, once you use the program, you discover how simple it is to use. Photoshop is the default, de facto standard for any, any kind of image editing program where it's photorealistic images. Obviously, if you're building race cars and doing uh, cartoon-type designs, you'll be working in a vector-based program like Corel Draw or Adobe Illustrator. But if you're going to be working with any designs that are pixel-based, I'm zooming in on this image right now, images that have lots of pixels and lots of colors and are more photorealistic, you're going to be needing Photoshop. Photoshop's available from a variety of sources, and it's around $650. You can buy it as a creative suite, which includes other Adobe programs, and again, you can use, uh, you can work on earlier versions. Now, think of Photoshop in what is commonly known as the 80-20 rule. You're going to use 20% of Photoshop 80% of the time. In fact, with Photoshop, it might even be the 90-10 rule. You're going to use 10% of the program 90% of the time. You're going to see in this example that I'm using some of the same things over and over again. Now, like all programs, Photoshop, ha all graphic programs, Photoshop has a toolbar. And it has the obvious pull-down menus, and they're long. You start looking at these things, and you get real nuts thinking, wow, I could never figure this out. Again, remember that you're going to be using some of these routines over and over again, and some of these buttons you're never going to go to. Photoshop has an excellent manual, and there's a number of excellent video training tapes on it. And in this short tutorial, the best we can do is give you the basics of the program and show you how to get images up and check them out. Now, again, Photoshop looks at every pixel. And so when you scan an image using a full color scanner, the scanner sees the object as pixels. Photoshop sees it as pixels. When you're working in a vector-based program like Illustrator or Corel Draw, those programs see the image as math. They see all the, the points from point A to point B, and Photoshop sees these as pixels. Now, I'm not going to cover every tool because it's just too much to cover. I'm not going to obviously cover every pull-down menu, but I'm going to show you what you do with Photoshop. In Photoshop, you can take in pretty much any file format the customer will give you other than it will not open up a Corel file because Corel is not a native Photoshop format. But Photoshop will open up files from Illustrator. It'll open up TIFF files, JPEG files, EPS files, PSDs, which are Photoshop's native format, file formats, and pretty much anything you can open in Photoshop, you can then use with TSEPs. So you'll sometimes hear that you can't work with maybe JPEGs, JPG, which is Joint Photographic Group file formats. You can't work with them because they can be low quality. Well, you can work with them. You're just your separations may be low quality. So with Photoshop, you open a file. In Photoshop, you can have more than one file open at a time, so you're always working on different files, and you can combine components from file to file. Here are the important, very important things with Photoshop. In Photoshop, you must know what the file resolution is, and you must know what you're working with. This file looks great right now, and I'm looking at it from a distance, obviously, on purpose. Let me open up a similar file and a similar file. Now, these files all look pretty much identical, I think. But the truth is they are very, very far from being identical. This file is 200 dots per inch, and I've got the file name named. In Photoshop, when you open a file up, even if you've never used some of these tools, the first thing you do is you go to the Image pull-down menu, and you come down to Image Size, and you check the file size. Now, you want to make sure it's set for pixels or in inches. It could be set for centimeters. And that's going to be real deceiving for you because you can see in centimeters it shows this file was 30, 31 wide, and you think maybe it's inches when it's not inches. So always make sure it's set for centimeters. Photoshop remembers some of the last settings you did. And if you've ever just screwed around with Photoshop, you may have changed this. So you want to check the, the physical size of the file. You want to always be working on the final size of the file and check the resolution of the file. Now, I covered some of this in fixing bad artwork, but these are some very simple Photoshop basics. This file is a good resolution. 200 pixels per inch. You want to be about 175 to 225 or higher for images of TCEPs, and you want to be at the final size. So we've checked the file size and resolution. This is actually quite good. Now, let's take a look at what appears to be the same file. Looks the same. And by the way, let's go back, and let me just quickly 
zoom in on the toolbar the safest tool is the zoom tool because in Photoshop all these tools do something and if you're on a tool and you click on your mouse you might do something to your file and so as you know in Corel Draw or Illustrator your safest tool is the pick tool in Photoshop the safest tool is the zoom tool all it does is zoom you in or out and it's like all zoom tools you hold down the the left mouse button and you zoom in let's zoom in now there's the wolf's nose at 200 dpi so from a distance, the file looked great. When we zoom in, the file looks fantastic. Let's take a look at the same. We think it's the same file. This file is 72 dots per inch. You go to the image pull down menu and come down to image size. It shows us that this file, this file is physically smaller. It's only six inches wide in inches, and it's only 72 dots per inch. Again, the file looks the same, but let's zoom in. Big difference. When you see a great looking image on a shirt and you wonder how they got it so sharp, it's because they probably worked with a good, clean, sharp piece of artwork. So that's the 200 DPI, that's the 72 DPI. Now, the other problem is, I mentioned a minute ago, that you can work with what's called a JPEG file format. JPEG file formats can be saved in various quality levels, and the lower the quality level, the crappier the file becomes. And JPEG tends to average things out and puts artifacts around the image and junk. And so this file, again, from a distance, looks great. And you might think, well, that's a real sharp file. I'll just run the routine on that. And next thing you know, you're calling and saying your file on the shirt is a little soft. You don't have all the detail, and you saw samples of TSEPs that showed great detail. Let's zoom in. Now this is a JPEG file, and it looks similar to the 72 DPI file, but look how it's got these boxes. It actually has boxes, boxes, not the little squares, but these boxes right here. This is where the JPEG file format is averaging things out. So with a JPEG file format, you can work with JPEG files, but your file may be softer, may be a little boxy, and obviously you want to check the file format, and if at all possible, work with the highest resolution file you can get. With that in mind, let's look at some of the tools. In the pull-down menu, one of the main tools you'll be using a lot, and as you watch the TSEPS training videos, you'll see me using this tool a whole lot. The tool is called the Curves, also called the Tone Curve in early versions of Photoshop. And a lot of your graphic uh, pixel-based programs have what's called the Curve. Now, the Curve shows you the image in kind of a linear basis and this is the shadow dark areas of my design this is the midtones of my design this is the highlights of my design if I move this curve in you'll see the light areas get lighter and lighter and lighter until I really have blasted the entire design out if I move the shadow curve over the shadow areas get darker and darker and darker now that's to an extreme if I move the midtone, though, the midtone is what you'll see me moving quite often. I can lighten the midtones without really affecting the shadows. The shadows are still dark, but not cl not closed in. The highlights are still there, but not totally washed out. So I can lighten and darken. I can also apply effects to the curve. I can give it what's called an S curve. An S curve darkens the shadows and lightens the highlights. Now with that in mind, this design looks pretty good, but a lot of times you'll get flat artwork, you know, artwork that is really dull and just really needs a little bit, little bit of boost. And so what you'll typically do is use the tone curve to take and try and improve the file. We know we need to check the file resolution, and if it's 72 dpi, it's 72 dpi, and I will show you in a second upsampling it, but we will typically take the tone curve and see if we can improve the file. We might sometimes just give it a slight S curve, darken the shadows slightly, lighten the highlights slightly, and give the file more contrast. Now, with the tone curve, you have a checkbox, and in most of your Photoshop menus, there's a checkbox called Preview. And Preview lets you see your changes. There's the original, there's the previewed version, and you can see that I have improved the color saturation also. Look at the yellows coming out a little more. So there's a number of menus you'll use on a regular basis, but the main one you'll be using is Tone Curve. You'll be checking the file size. These are all under the Image pull-down menu. Now, on the toolbar, the upper left tool is called the Rectangular Marquee Tool. And if we click and drag the mouse, we select an area. This is the same as clicking on an object in Corel or Illustrator. We have just selected just this rectangular area. And now in Photoshop, 
everything that happens to our design only happens to this area. If we go to the image pull down menu to adjustments and back to curves, now when we apply a tone curve, it only happens to this area. Now you typically wouldn't be doing it just to an area like that, but sometimes you'll select the entire design or you'll select maybe there's an area that's a graphical area. Maybe you want to put a black box behind something or on a design, and right now I've selected this, and these are called the marching ants. This is a very common Photoshop term called the marching ants, called a selection. Now when you're, when you're done with your selection, because you'll be using this, and believe it or not, I'll show you how this has a practical application. When you're done with your selection, you must take the marching ants off. If you go to the Select pull-down menu, you click on Deselect, R is Control D on the PC, Option D on the Mac, and we do a Deselect. Now we can also hold the mouse button down on the Rectangular Marquee Tool and come down to the Elliptical Marquee Tool. And we can select just a specific area. I'm going to take the marching ants off, Control-D on the PC. If you hold the Shift key down when you use this tool or the Rectangular Marquee tool, it forces it to be either a square or a circle. Now again, there's no real practical application here, but let's click on the Zoom tool. Let's zoom in on the head. And let's click on the tool below this called the lasso tool. This is one you'll use more often. The lasso tool, it looks like a little lasso. And basically, it's a selection tool. And I could actually lasso around the wolf's face here. And now, everything I do only happens to the wolf's face. So if I go again to Tone Curve, Image Adjustments, Curves, I can just lighten or darken the wolf's face. Now again, not a practical application here, but you can use this to select very specific areas of your designs and improve them. Now, let's leave the selection on here for right now. We have the toolbar, the pull-down menus, and we have what's called palettes. These are the three basic areas of the Photoshop workspace. Right now I have the channels palette available, and this file is RGB, and your files should be RGB as opposed to CMYK. And if I click on the image pull-down menu and come down to mode, I can check and make sure it's RGB. It must not say index color. If it does, you can just click on it and change it. If it says CMYK color, I just change this to CMYK to show you. You can, If you get the file this way, you can go to the image pull-down menu, come down to mode, and just click on RGB. You just convert it back to RGB. So these are called palettes. There's a lot of palettes in Photoshop. In fact, when you open Photoshop, there are dozens of palettes open. You find the palettes from the window pull-down menu. And I'm going to open up a palette called History, and I'm going to open up a palette called Info, and I'll put it down here. Sometimes you run out of real estate. Now bear in mind that the screen capture programs that we use to make these videos let's, really forces us to compress the Photoshop screen. If I was looking at this full monitor, I would have plenty of real estate, but because of the screen capture programs where I'm forced to keep it within 720 by 480 pixels, it's really hard to show all the palettes. You close the palettes out with the X in the upper right hand corner, or you can actually undock palettes. You can carry it away with your palettes. That's why you need a lot of real estate, and working on a high resolution monitor is much better. A good graphic artist typically has this thing Photoshop full screen with palettes everywhere and still room to show their image. Now we can click and drag and undock the palettes we can click and drag and dock them. And sometimes it requires getting your mouse just right. We can click and drag and dock them. We can click in the clear area around the palette tabs and roll them up, get them out of the way. 